Ladies and gentlemen, would you please welcome Phil Jupiter. Welcome to the uh, West End of London and my elaborately designed set. Uh, it's basically me and a ruler. Pretty good, huh? <laughs> oh, line there, line there, line there, line there, line there, line there. That'll do me. So, uh, hi, I'm Phil, 20 stone. I know you were wondering. Um, <laughs> I was uh, reading an article, it's a true story, I was reading an article recently uh, about near-death experiences and being a comedian, it's a subject I'm fucking interested in. So. <laughs> And it was like they had five people that had, 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 you know, died and been brought back, you know. And they'd gone, one of them was like gone for five minutes and then been revived. And they asked them all what they remembered from it. And, and, and it was eerie because all of them said, well, it's weird because the vision kind of goes all tunnelly. You get like tunnelly vision. And then they, there was this bright light. But they weren't afraid of the light. And they felt themselves being drawn towards the light. All right? You know, and they were getting closer and closer to the light. And I, and I thought this was good. And maybe this means that there's something to, you know, spirituality and maybe there is a God. And then I wondered, how do tube drivers know when they're dead? <laughs> Let's say you're a tube driver and you have a massive heart attack when you're on the job, you know. And then tunnel, bright light, you're thinking, Hoban. <laughs> You're supposed to be preparing yourself for the next world, but no, you know. You arrive at the bright light, you, you hear, Dave. And you think, oh, they fixed the PA. <laughs> what if you're a tube train driver and you're a massive hypochondriac, though, you know, and every time you pull out of a station, ah, the tunnel, the light, the rapture, no, I've died, I've died, I've died. Oh, no, 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 it's Piccadilly, Piccadilly, it's Piccadilly. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, I apologise for the announcement about my death. <laughs> this is Piccadilly. Change here for the blue line. <laughs> this is such a cool job, this. I really love it because, you know, you can take absolutely anything and, you know, make grist from it. One of the things I'm really going to miss, though, uh, Clinton goes out this year, and that's a great shame because he provided so many comedians with so much great material. But on the positive side, his wife is running for Senate in New York, which is a good thing. Good old Hillary. Hillary Clinton, the Marge Simpson of international politics. <laughs> I've actually got a video. You remember when he did the video appearance and he went, I did not have sex with that woman, when he did that speech. If you've got a video of that and you crank the volume up really loud, he goes, I did not have sex with Miss Lewinsky. In the background, you can just hear. <clears throat> You told me you didn't have sex with that woman, Bill. But Hillary! I'm the president. I lied. Mmm, <laughs> interns. Oh, I'm going to miss him a bit. It's fantastic. Oh, I've got my own problems. Anyway, I've got my own problems. I'm a parent. I'm a dad. I've got two daughters and a uh, bit of a situation the other day. My eldest brought a boy home for the first time. And I think it's safe to say that I reacted quite badly. <laughs> she came in and she went, all right, Dad, this is Billy. And I went, Billy! You going to put the kettle on, darling? While I talk to Billy. <laughs> she went out the room, and I went up to this Billy, and I went, if you so much as touch her, I'll cut you. <laughs> this Billy starts crying. Still, they're seven-year-olds for you, no spine. for your mum and all. <laughs> I'm tough but fair.
terrible. You know, it's odd because the kids, you know, they're growing up in the new millennium and they're like into computers and stuff. I can't even get any respect to, you know, electrical retailers. I bought a cinema sound TV and I got completely fucked over when I bought this thing. I went, you know, I went down to the shop and I made the mistake of going at the weekend because you only get professional service from electronics retailers if you go during the week. Because the regular staff are on. You go during the way and you go, I'd like to buy a television, please. They go, certainly, sir, if you'd like to follow me. There's a full range over there. You know, uh, just uh, when you've found one you like, give us a shout. I'll tell you a bit more about it. That's great. I went on a Saturday. What a fool. I walk in, I go, hello, I'd like to buy a television, please. Hey, eh? what? Eh? <laughs> Dave, do we do televisions? <laughs> His hair's up here. The badge is upside down. He's got acne. I can hear, madam. Audible acne. <laughs> he sounds like bubbling minestrone. <laughs> I go, I'd like to buy a television. Oh, right, follow me. Right, uh, right, television, 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 television. That's a television and all. There's another television. That's a television. That's a television. It's a big pile of microwaves. Then I do that thing that all middle-aged men do when they go to shops and they're not getting the service they want, they become posher. Because <laughs> I went in and I went, all right, mate, can I buy a television, please? Perfectly normal, but, you know, he's fucked me off, so now it's, fetch me your manager immediately, young man, <laughs> for I am the mayor of Casterbridge. <laughs> and I demand satisfaction in my electrical retailing. Go, Heather, bring him forth. <laughs> oh, I'll go and get him. <laughs> so he goes off. He returns with a toddler. <laughs> this is Mr. Cavendish, my supervisor. Pokemon pajamas, Thomas the Tank Engine slippers. <laughs> and I went, he's two! And then Mr. Cavendish starts crying. I felt horrible. <laughs> Made the supervisor cry. Eventually, the situation was resolved by the branch manager, who was a fetus in a bell jar. <laughs> oh, fucking hell, they're young at them shops, aren't they? So, I got a Cinema Sound TV. It's fantastic, you know, and it's got a big red button on the remote. Cinema Sound. And so I put, I put the old DVD in, and I go... Cinema sound, and this voice behind me goes, put your head down, you fat twat. <laughs> Ten minutes later, I hear an old man finishing a Kia Aura. <laughs> I've heard these things in cinemas, it's just not what I was looking for. <laughs> the rule of thumb is these days, if you get a big fuck off TV, you must get a big fuck off film to watch on it. So I got a couple. I got The Phantom Menace. It's all right. Not bad if you like that sort of thing. It's not bad if you're completely obsessed by it as well. <laughs> I got it, The Phantom Menace. I like it, but it's a touch over Celtic, don't you find? It's a little bit of a Celtic film, you know. You've got Liam Neeson, haven't you? Liam Neeson in the Qui Gon Jin, the Jedi Master, and so and so he is. He is. <laughs> ah, Obi Wan, my cheeky Jedi bucko. Come, come with me, little fella, and learn the ways of the Force. <laughs> I'm surprised Yoda didn't come out in a little green hat with a buckle on it, pig under his arm. Ah, Qui Gon, are you telling the little fella about the Force? And I. <laughs> that I am Yoda, and why don't you give us a song? <laughs> Jedi dance. I <laughs> oh, should have called it the Phantom McMenace. <laughs> Anakin's ashes. So, that is such a cracking film reference, sir, and it went over many people's heads. <laughs> I'm surprised the cores weren't in it. <laughs> Do you ever get the feeling when you watch the cores that somewhere in the world there's an Irish theme pub with no staff in it? <laughs> I was watching. I was. I was watching the cause in concert once, and uh, and their brother was being sucked off by a goat, but nobody noticed. <laughs> Will you not look at me now? I'm being sucked off by a goat over here. 
Ah, go on and look at me now. Stop looking at them. I know, they're gorgeous, and so they are. They're my sisters, and I'd take a crack at them, but come on. I mean, something up by a goat over here. Somebody pay attention to me now. Ewan McGregor as Obi-Wan Kenobi. There's an odd piece of casting for you. All right, Obi-Wan Kenobi. I'm a Jedi. I know the perfect person for that particular gig. All you had to do was go back to the source material. The great, late Saranac Guinness. You know, look, I knew your father. We were at prep school together. Yes, we would bathe each other in the showers in a cheeky way. <laughs> yes, he was a Jedi too. It's Eddie Izzard, isn't it? Kenobi, Jedi, good thing. Uh, 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 these are really good for making toast, you know. <laughs> toast Darth Vader and then stab him. <laughs> With Harry Hill as Darth Vader. <laughs> Chocolate chip cookie, you bag of the wookie, gotta have a system. Mm, 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 mm. I'm your dad. What are the chances of that happening? <laughs> oh, so I got Apollo 13 as well, I got Apollo 13. There's a great film. And in watching Apollo 13, I realised why the British never went into space. And it's not because we didn't have the technology, the desire or the funding. It's because the British just would have been shit in space. The Americans are just built for that kind of gig, you know. I think it's to do, you see, the Americans, it's a very young nation, isn't it? They've only been over there for a few hundred years. And they went, they tear us across the continent, wipe out the indigenous population. Then they get to the Pacific and they go, is that it? We want more. <laughs> ding, 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 ding. We're hungry for fun. And then they, uh, uh, well, we'll go up there. Fuck it, let's have a go. <laughs> Went into space. You see, us, the British, we've been on this little rock just off the coast of Europe in the middle of the Atlantic for fucking thousands of years, and all we're interested in really is tea and biscuit. <laughs> space? I don't know if I really want to go to space. Will there be tea and biscuits? <laughs> I think I'll stay here and moan about things if that's all right with you. <laughs> Neil Armstrong. Neil Armstrong, you see, he was the first man on the moon. He, he made that historic step and he said, this is one small step for man, but a giant leap for mankind. History making words. We are just so fortunate that it wasn't an Englishman that was the first on the moon, because he would have gone, oh, I'm getting on the moon now. I'm on it. I'll be frank with you, it's a bit of a shithole. <laughs> oh, I'm coming on. <laughs> Put a kettle on Barry. <laughs> and Apollo 13, you know, those, those three brave American astronauts, you know, 500,000 miles from home, <laughs> their rocket blows up, you know, and you can't call AA Relay, they don't go out that far. <laughs> so they go, AA Relay. Yeah, ma'am, we're currently in a rocket heading for our fiery deaths. Can you assist over? 45 minutes, sir. <laughs> Please remain with your rocket. <laughs> you see, that's it. You know, they get the British astronauts. The British astronauts in Apollo 13. It just wouldn't have been the same thing at all, would it? <laughs> what the fucking hell was that? <laughs> I shat myself up here. <laughs> come to think of it, it's a good job I'm wearing the space suit now, isn't it? Oh, it's come up now, it's come up. Oh. 
Oh, that is not nice. <laughs> Who's that bang? Why are you shouting at me? <laughs> I are down here, you know, pottering about. I heard the bang, I think we all did. You know, and then you start shouting. That's just compounding the situation. I are already nervous, you know. And then you, captain of the mission, Mr. Steady Hand at the Tiller, shouting and screaming like an girl. <laughs> Shut up! <laughs> What's the matter with the rocket? Oh, sorry, I didn't know. Right, well, uh, I've had a quick look, and the rocket is broken. <laughs> it's broken? Oh, I do not want to hear that. I've got mission control. <laughs> Hello, mission control. This is Apollo 13. Please respond. Over. <laughs> Ho air, Apollo 13. This is mission control, Whitley B. <laughs> what appears to be the trouble, Bonnie lad? <laughs> trouble? I'll tell you the fucking trouble, pal. <laughs> the rocket's broken! The rocket's broken! The rocket's broken! <laughs> Calm down, Apollo 13. <laughs> Calm? Fuck off, Carl! <laughs> You're not the one in a broken fucking rocket, pal! <laughs> I want you to know, Apollo 13, all the lads here at Whitley Bay are rooting for you. <laughs> and in a situation like this, every single second is absolute... Oh, we're petty, all right. <laughs> You're looking awfully cunny to deer, like. <laughs> Have you? Aye, two sugars, love, yeah. <laughs> Do not forget how many sugars I have. I know, I'm not, I'm not sweet enough. I'll go on with you. Have you got any wagon wheels, love? <laughs> See, we couldn't go into space, the British as a nation, you know. I think that's you know, part of my problem, you see. I come from that weird nation also, but I think personally I can't deal with technology. I know this for a, I know this for a fact now, because recently I bought my first computer. Yes! Just into a new millennium, just in time, I got a new computer, and you know, it's brilliant. The last thing I bought was a stylophone, for God's sake, you know. That. Uh, I learned the beginning of life on Mars, and then that was it. <laughs> but now I've got a computer, it's fantastic. And uh, I got an iMac, I bought it off my mum, because she bought it, and she was trying to use it to get the hair off her legs. And, uh, <laughs> I think she really fully grasped the concept. So I bought this thing off her, and uh, it's fantastic. You get it, and you know I was, I was not very good at first. You know you crash it an awful lot, and I, I, I didn't, you know I don't really trust computers. I think it's the fault of, of every computer you've ever seen. Fiction is always a force of evil, isn't it? Bond villains always had a supercomputer, didn't they? Oh yes, Mr. Bond, I'm going to destroy the beautiful city of Paris. Over there, those 28 wardrobes have over one meg of memory. My supercomputer will destroy Paris, Mr. Bond, when I press this button. <laughs> oh, what's gone wrong with it, Graham? Oh, it hasn't. Not again. <laughs> but hang on a minute. Yeah. Hello? Yes, 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 yes. Is Professor Evil here? <laughs> I bought a 386 Essex Evil computer from you, and it keeps crashing. Hold on. Graham, have you pressed Control, Alt, and Delete? <laughs> it didn't work. <laughs> Unplug it and plug it in again. <laughs> uh, a bit of a problem there. We've got it wired into my volcano. <laughs> you see, I grew up, I remember, as a kid, I went to see 2001. How could you ever trust a computer after seeing that film? At, at no point did you ever see Dave the Astronaut on the phone to the technical support line, did you? Hello, it's Dave the Astronaut here. I bought a HAL computer from you a while ago, and it's playing up a bit. What's it done? Well, it's killed all my friends. <laughs> now, I've had a look in the troubleshooting guide, and there's nothing about murder in it. Who are you talking to, Dave? Shut up! <laughs> and another thing, you didn't tell me it was gay. Dave, come over here and look in me red eye. Fuck off! <laughs> my computer spoke to me. I shat myself. It was unbelievable, you know, because I'm there. I crashed it, and I'm looking in the manual, and suddenly it goes, Alert! Ah! 
you have committed a type 3942 error. Please refer to the manual or reboot system. <laughs> Brilliant. It's this weird sort of robot -y woman's voice comes out. And I investigate a little more and all computers talk now. And this is Victoria, high quality. And I must say, I find her quite alluring. <laughs> Start crashing the computer deliberately. <laughs> Alert. You have committed a type 392 error. I know, I'm a bad boy. <laughs> so it's fantastic. So you get this thing, the, the whole selling point of the iMac is you can whack it straight in the wall and you send people email straight away. So that's what I did. I got it all set up. I've got 10 friends' email addresses. And so I'm like, it's in the wall. And I'm like, OK, here we go. Steve, you're a wanker. <laughs> send a new mail. Barry, you're a wanker. Send new mail. <laughs> Dave, you wanker. <laughs> Send new mail. <laughs> Debbie, show us your tits. Woohoo! <laughs> Send new mail. Gordon, Gordon. Ah, wanker. <laughs> Send new. <laughs> Boom. You have email. Ooh. Open. Phil, you wanker. <laughs> Information superhighway. <laughs> So of course, being, um, you know, I'm in showbiz, so I put my own name in one of them search engines, Yahoo, Google, Ask Jeeves, whatever, I don't know what it was. And I went in, I put my name in, and it came out, you know, we have 40 matches, and there's sort of 39 shit reviews. And then, at the bottom, there's this weird thing, and in the middle of it, it says, this sentence that kind of caught my eye. I saw that Phil Jupiter shopping in Sainsbury's the other day. <laughs> I'm fucking looking at that. <laughs> And I open it and it's like, Bill's homepage. <laughs> Jesus. And so I go down a bit and this is what it says. It says, saw that Phil Jupiter, so I've never mind a buzzcut shopping in Sainsbury's the other day. I couldn't see what he bought though. <laughs> and that is the entire contents of the website I saw Phil Jupiter's information, super highway. <laughs> It's fantastic, though. If you're into things that you can't find out about over here, I'm quite a, an, an America file. I'm into baseball, you know, I can look up the Red Sox scores using the computer. I'm into American comics, Doonesbury and Milk and Cheese. I can find out stuff about them. There's some uh, www.theonion.com, incredibly funny website. I urge you to go there. If you're into weird images, I hotly recommend www.rotten.com. And over there, that filthy laugh is of a regular user of this particular... <laughs> It's got, it's, it's got things like autopsy photos on it of celebrities, but my favourite thing it's got on there, it's got this thing called Animal Curiosities, and there is a photo, I shit you not, of a raccoon fucking a beagle. <laughs> the beagle is sort of like... He looks like a beagle, business as usual, in beagle world. But the raccoon, you see... He's little and he's a rodent and he's like, what, he's like this. He's really sort of giving it some and his little stripy tail stuck out the back. But he looks ever so slightly sinister because, you know, raccoons have that little mask going on. <laughs> a little woodland rapist animal. <laughs> Every man in this room that has a computer has that moment. You've got quite au fait with using it, you know. I'd had this thing for about a week, you know, late one night, family are all in bed. <laughs> kind of tired myself. Mm. And a little bit lonely, truth be told. <laughs> Ladies. Search. Then the filth starts arriving from all over the world. Pornography starts coming into my computer. It's unbelievable. Pornogra but I mean, pornography, you know, rather. Over in, in, in England, we have this really quaint view of pornography, don't we? You say, Would you like to see me jumpless for a tenner, sir? <laughs> so that's English porn, isn't it? You know, oh, look at me, body. <laughs> Whereas foreign porn has this curious thing called sex in it. And uh, <laughs> people actually having intercourse, which is quite lovely, I can assure you. And, these images I've never seen before. I've never seen photos of it in my life. Wow! No. That is not his real. Ooh. Oh, yeah. No, keep on that one. Ah. Mum! www.mymum.com. Not going there again. So 
Stop it! I used to eat out of those. You think that's bad? She's in tonight. Uh, so... <laughs> terrible, isn't it? It's weird because the computer was developed to advance humanity. And you bent double over it like some sort of caveman. <laughs> My technology good. <laughs> but it's weird because you see, you've got the, the, this hand, the penis hand, is also the mouse hand. There's a dichotomy at work. <laughs> then let's also factor in the fact that you don't want to get any belly butter on the keyboard, do you? So you're like. <laughs> After a computer wank, you're like some sort of ninja. It's unbelievable. <laughs> You know, you've been up late at night abusing yourself over a computer, and it's a real giveaway when you go to the, you know, computer shop and you go, yeah, I need a windscreen wiper for the computer. <laughs> I made a huge mistake, because the first time I ever masturbated over the computer, I'm there and I'm bashing away, and I'm thinking, oh, I can't get anything over the computer. So at the very last minute, I turn away. Whoa! Forgetting, over here is the DVD player. <laughs> I've just got too many gadgets, you know. I'm going to hit something. And that's not a nice experience. You have to take that down the shop, you know. Hi. Uh, hi. Uh, the kids were horsing around with some yogurt yesterday. And, uh... <laughs> Don't worry, sir. That's the 25th yogurty DVD player we've had this week. <laughs> but you become, you become sexually jaded. Don't you? Because, you know, there is now nothing I haven't seen. There's nothing at all, you know. And, you know, I think, oh, I'll go out and have a wank. <laughs> Hang on, hang on a minute, hang on a minute, let's, let's stretch the imagination. Two weasels, fucking a skateboard. <laughs> Search. Boom. Right, that's what that looks like then, okay. <laughs> Some monkeys buggering a rhinoceros. Search. Boom. <sighs> Such a shame. You see, now and my wife knows this is what I'm up to late at night. I say, yeah, we've got to go and do the accounts. <laughs> You've been wanking, haven't you? <laughs> you see, I try and justify the technology. I'm always saying, it's a real boon. It's, a real, it's advancing the world. Computers are important, love. They really are. I'm sorry. I have to be up there at the frontiers of science. <laughs> I said, they're talking about putting computer chips in blokes. This is it. This is a true story. Research scientists in Cambridge have had one of their, one of their fellows has had a computer chip placed in his arm and what they are thinking of in the future we'll have smart houses when you get home the house has a little scanner around the front door knows you've got in <laughs> fills home puts on the lights where you are activates the heating and the utilities in the room you're in if you're going to the television room it puts the telly on to your favorite channel they spend a week monitoring your habits and then they think for you and I said this is going to be a real advance love I'm sorry but technology's there and she said nah waste of time if you had a computer chip in you, you would just program it to remind you to wank once in a while. <laughs> and I said, well, there's no need for that, because the thought, have a wank, drifts around every man's mind like a kind of screensaver, doesn't it? <laughs> have a wank. 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 <laughs> Flying toaster. Have a wank. <laughs> so that when you finish your business for the day, you know, something immediately springs to mind. So it's like, okay, right, I've done the accounts, I went to Ikea, I got that shelf unit, dropped the kids off at school, and I've done the shopping. Okay, well, that's me <sighs> done for the day. <laughs> so here's it. So I'm, you know, I'm a technophobe. You know that about me. I'm also, it's weird, because I do this for a living. I'm a stand-up comic for, for a living. Uh, and it makes me quite frightened that real life is funnier than anything I can make up. That has always, always been one of my principal fears, that, that life is just so stoked with irony that I can't possibly compete. And, and my favourite ever story to illustrate this fact, I'm going to tell it to you now. It's a true tale. It took place a few years ago at London Zoo. This is a true story. Um, a woman took London Zoo to court about four years ago because an elephant threw a log at her. <laughs> She's there for a day out, herself, her husband, their two lovely children, and this elephant slung a log at her, bam, it hit her right in the forehead, 
She was unconscious, this is true this, unconscious for half an hour and she needed 14 stitches in the head wound that was sustained. And when she woke up, as you can imagine, a bit fucked off. Because <laughs> there's nothing in the brochure about it. <laughs> Watch out for the elephants, they're a bit handy, if you get my meaning. <laughs> oh, okay. So she, you know, she gets twatted by this elephant and she's, all right, I'm going to take London Zoo to court. Now, I'm no legal expert. But if I was the lawyer for London Zoo, my first question to this woman in cross-examination would simply have to be, excuse me, how fucking stupid do you have to be not to see an elephant with a log? <laughs> you know, it's not a squirrel with a flick knife we're talking about here. It's the largest land animal in the world holding a bit of telegraph pole in its nose, as if that wasn't stupid enough already. You know, it's not a badger with nunchuckers, it's a fucking elephant with a log. And it happened in the elephant house. I'd have a degree of sympathy for this woman if it happened in the aquarium. <laughs> it's dark in that aquarium, you know, conceivably the elephant could creep up on you. <laughs> I'd have to be wearing plimsolls or something, you know. <laughs> I'm the daddy of the zoo now! Ludicrous state of affairs. But she took legal advice and, you know, they said, well, you know, you can do the zoo for negligence, but that takes a long while to go through because it's corporate crime. So what she decided to do was she decided to sue the elephant for assault. Because <laughs> assault cases do have to go through quicker. Yeah. But the trouble is, with an assault case, is you do have to have a positive identification from a line-out. <laughs> So she has got to go to Camden Police Station and they're all going to be there. <laughs> Number one. <laughs> Number two. <laughs> Number three. <laughs> Number four. Number two. <laughs> yeah, number two. The ladies picked you out, number two. <laughs> two steps forward, please. Could you turn to the left, please, number two? Around <laughs> to the right. Face forward, please, number two. Would you now trumpet, please, number two? Number five, two steps forward, please. <laughs> two steps forward, please, number five. Come on, we haven't got all day.
one will only move. Then, right. Say it again. Right. Kumbale, jeldi jeldi. Did either of them ring any bells at all, love? <laughs> I've seen up and here again. <laughs> so London Zoo, she's taking London Zoo to court as well. That's a fool's errand. London Zoo's always in the evening standard moaning that they've got no money. Oh, yeah, 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 we're going to have to shut. Nah, they just say that to get people, you can't shut the zoo, the poor animals. They never shut that zoo. The only day you'd know London Zoo was shut is if you pulled up in the lights at Regent Street, a silverback gorilla clambers on your bonnet with a squeegee. Then you know. <laughs> I, uh, that, you know, London Zoo should be the most prosperous zoo in the world. I could get London Zoo five million quid next Tuesday. Put me on after EastEnders. There now follows a broadcast on behalf of the London Zoological Society. Hello, I'm TV's Bill Juniper. <laughs> you know, London Zoo has been here for over a hundred years. One of the most popular tourist attractions in the whole capital. It's given so much to millions of people. Like the children here from St Ignatius' Primary School. The little Dickenses. Look at them scamper around. It's terrible to think that a zoo like this might not be here for much longer for them or indeed the generations to follow little Timmy over there is playing on our interactive computer center and little Sally over there is doing a drawing of a marmoset it's lovely and I'm gonna take it home with me <laughs> they can interact not only with technology and with creative materials but also with animals animals like Bingo the chinchilla here isn't he beautiful <laughs> absolutely lovely isn't he I'm going to be killing one of these things every hour on the hour until you send me some cash. <laughs> Sorry, son, got a bit of chinchilla on you there. <laughs> I'm Bill Juniper. Thank you. <laughs> they should be making a fortune, that zoo, because they could make a virtue of the fact I would pay good money to see an elephant throw a log at a moron. I don't know about you. <laughs> I paid 20 fucking some dozy mare, she was asking for it. <laughs> Good, one less moron. Hooray! I'd sat there with my popcorn. <laughs> Way! 20 quid well spent. <laughs> the zoo doesn't know how to market itself. It doesn't know how to capitalise on golden opportunities. Remember when blokes were getting in with the lions? I'd pay to see that. I saw it once on telly and it was the most exciting moment of my life. Imagine seeing it live. People getting in with the lions and nearly being eaten. What a result. <laughs> I'll never forget it as long as I live. It's on News at 10. I'm watching News at 10. You know, it's business as usual. Trev's on, you know. Bong. Something terrible. <laughs> Bong. A further terrible thing. <laughs> Bong. A third thing, even more terrible than the first two terrible things. Bong. I don't even want to fucking talk about the fourth terrible thing. <laughs> Bong. And the man climbs into the line enclosure at London Zoo. We have footage after the break. And I'm like, fuck off, Trev, you're having a laugh. <laughs> and he goes, no, I seen the film earlier. The geezer gets in the cage with the lions. They're chasing him. What is he like? So I'm gripped to the telly then, and sure enough, after the break, it comes on, you know. Today, a man was seriously injured when he climbed into the line enclosure at London Zoo in Regent's Park. A tourist who was there captured the entire event on film, a section of which we are going to show to you now. Viewers of a nervous disposition may like to turn away. This is the point at which I find myself pressing play and record. <laughs> There is nothing quite like the words tragedy today at the Farnborough Air Show. Send me scurrying for a blank video.
Dead. Alive again. Dead. Alive again. God with a remote. So I'm watching this film with this bloke. And they've taken the sound off it, which I think is a wise move, because it's just some punter going, There's a bloke in with a lie! Mr. Zookeeper! Mr. Zookeeper, a man! There's a man in with a Mr. Zookeeper! He's in with a lie! Mr. Zookeeper! I will not stop filming! <laughs> they've taken that off, you know, because that's not good news reportage, is it? You know, well, it is on Sky News, isn't it? and guns and that, and shooting! It's horrible, and explosions! I don't like it, I wanna go home! I wanna go home! Dave Jackson, Sky News, Belgrade. <laughs> so they show this bit of footage, and I've studied it, oh, I don't know, on 900 times, so I know what happens. And what the fella does, is he's sort of there, in the corner of the shot, and then he, he gets over the low wall, Step one, accomplished. What does he have to negotiate now? Eight foot rose garden. Pretty easy gig. Does the eight foot rose garden. Then, ah, the moat. Ah, he's at the moat. Surely that will stop him. Unless, of course, he can uh, swim. <laughs> oh, didn't think that one through, did we? He's taking the piss now. He dives into the moat, does a somersault in the middle, swims across, a butterfly. You know, he's having a laugh. Yeah. Gets out the other side, you know, wet and mad. And I think, well, he won't get any further now because he's moist. And his hands won't gain any purchase on the bars. And indeed, this is a good point well made. He would not have been able to scale the bars at the old cage at London Zoo because they were cast iron vertical bars. He'd have just got four foot up and then <laughs> slid down. But the new enclosure they built in the late 70s, early 80s has both vertical and horizontal, let's call them ladder style bars <laughs> for ease of nutterage. He's up there <laughs> in a shade under three seconds and then he just rolls over the top and drops into the cage. And this is a point the media picked up on. They said, if you'd had barbed wire on that cage, he wouldn't have got in. Raise the wire, something like that. And the zoo bloke said, well, yeah, we do have to hold our hands up to that point. But with this particular enclosure, uh, it's a design feature. The reason we don't have barbed wire on it is because there's fucking lions in it! <laughs> you know, and we kind of thought... That lions were just, you know, the, the, the barbed wire gilding the lily a little bit. Just, just slightly too much. If you're going to have barbed wire, then you've got to have security towers, German guards, machine guns, a vaulting horse for the lions, one of whom's probably in the corner of the cage, forging French travel documents! <laughs> so this guy has dropped into the cage. And I'm watching this at my home, and I'm watching this bloke, he stood there. <laughs> but for like 15 seconds, nothing happens. Because the lions are obviously thinking the same thing as me. You know, what the fuck is he doing there? <laughs> the truth is, actually, is the lions were, it's quite a large enclosure. The lions were, you know, about 40 foot away in the other corner of the cage. And they stood there, three of them, in a little huddle. No, 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 all I'm saying <laughs> is that one of the monkeys told me that the tigers get more meat than us. <laughs> well, yeah, no, no, my point is, is that goes completely against the arbitration that we had two years ago. It was supposed to be a blanket, 50 kilos per big cat per week. And the monkey told me that the tigers are getting 70. Now, if that is true, we've got a very good case for compensation. <laughs> well, I, all I propose is we draft a, a memo to the head keeper, you know. I don't think we should outright accuse him of anything because then that gets off on the wrong foot. You know, but, you know, the fact of the matter is, Lions, King of the Beast, should count for something. We've got a lot of good licensing deals out there. We've got the Lion Bar, the Lion King. That's doing very well still in the West End, I can assure you. We've also got, you know, the, the Peugeot logo. We're all over the government stationery. You know, what have they got? They've got the cereal and they've got the petrol. That's it. <laughs> Stripey tracks.
that's, that's just getting old. So, what I propose we do... What? There's a what? Oh, do grow up, Gavin. Yes, yes, there's a bloke in the cage. Good one. You must have been working on that for weeks. How spontaneous. Yes, and you're jumping up and down and pointing in his direction. What a very similitude. Oh, I'm bound to turn around now. Would you stop it? I'm talking about something very serious here. This whole meat is... Stop pointing. You don't have fingers. You look stupid. <laughs> all right, look, Gavin, I'm going to turn around, but we all know that there is not a... Bl no! <laughs> supposed to wear trousers. <laughs> uh, stay there, stay there. Excuse me, are you a keeper? Hello? He can't hear me, he's singing. <laughs> Gav, have we had any memos about new feeding arrangements? <laughs> go on, go on, go on, have a quick look in the file. Uh, it'll be under S for schedules. <laughs> Set and draw. Uh, nothing? Is there anything in the intro on top? <laughs> nothing there either. Hang on, I'll check the answer phone. <laughs> All right, it's the elephants here. <laughs> Listen. If you fancy a laugh, right? <laughs> throw stuff at the punters. <laughs> you should see them running, they look fucking. <laughs> uh, I got one the other day, fucking. Uh, <laughs> speak to you later, ta -ta. Hello, it's the Tigers here. <laughs> we were wondering if you'd like to come for a barbecue next week. We do seem to have rather a lot of meat lying around the place. <laughs> do give us a call. There's nothing on the answer phone about it. Look, what we... Oh, hang on, this could be it. Hello, lions. <laughs> Pardon me? H who? Uh, yeah, yeah, could you hold on a sec? Is there a Mr. Suck you off here? <laughs> a Mr. Suck you off? Ladies and gentlemen, I'm looking for a Mr. Suck you off. Sorry? A Lionel Suck you off. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, a Lionel Suck you off. Please, apparently there's an important message here. A Lionel Suck you off. Oh fuck, it's the monkeys, you little twats! <laughs> Yeah, ooh, ooh, ooh. Yeah, I'll fucking do you, pal. <laughs> Look at me like that, Gavin. I was not the one that bought them phone cards for Christmas. <laughs> Maybe we've had an email about it. Check that. It's, yeah, I was, I was on the web before. Yeah, it's, look, I'm on... I'm on the internet, yeah, it's Slow Fat Disabled Antelope's website. It's one of my favourites. Could... <laughs> Come out of, yeah, double click on that icon. E email. I told you to go on the course, man. Double click on email. We've got one. Oh, brilliant. Read it out, read it out. I'm a wanker. <laughs> All right. Well, fuck it, let's eat him. <laughs> oh, um. And the lions, they do, they go across to eat him. But, um, you know when you watch documentaries of lions and normally they go, Arr. and they look quite cross when they're attacking. Arr. Now I remember, because I've still got it on video, the lions when they go for this bloke, they're sort of, <laughs> <laughs> I know, I'm as surprised as you. <laughs> In the cage, who knew? <laughs> well, when in Rome.
<laughs> the media went completely mental about this, you know, they were totally up in arms about the whole affair. Zoo of death! Despite the fact the bloke didn't die, you know, but, you know, zoo of injury is a really shit headline. So, <laughs> zoo of death! And London Zoo doubled its security measures, you know, uh, they had to put a sign up, please do not ride the lions. <laughs> and then they put a bloke on the gate who goes, morning, welcome to London Zoo, don't get in with the lions, will you? <laughs> morning, welcome to London Zoo, don't get in with the lions, will you? Now, despite these cast iron measures, <laughs> oh shit, you know, a month later another bloke got in with the lions, another bloke got in with the lions. But he'd obviously seen the first bloke on television and learnt from his mistakes. He's done one of two things while he's watching the footage at home as well. He's either gone... <laughs> no, nah, that's not how you do it. <laughs> Look at him, stupid idiot. Wrong! Or he's watching it and he's gone... I'm having some of that. <laughs> Either way, his mission is to get in with the lions. So what he does is he studies the first bloke and he likes the whole wall, rose garden, moat, up and over technique. All good, that far, plan, flawless. But I don't like the being eaten by the lions bit. He thinks, how can we stop that? What the first bloke did was he got in the cage as an omnivore with three carnivores and thus was lower in the food chain. Ah, so second bloke thinks... If I take food for the lions and give it to them, I will be an equal and they will allow me to enter the pride structure. <laughs> Which is logical when you think about it. And that's what he did. He took food for the lions. Genius. What did he take? <laughs> Zebra? Antelope? Hippo? Oh no. He took one medium Tesco's oven ready chicken. <laughs> there are three 700 pound lions in that cage. And this geezer took one, a medium one. That's the fucking kicker. Medium. He's there in Tesco's. There are large chickens, extra large, turkeys, geese, whole sides of lamb. But no, one fucking medium oven ready chicken, you know. And when I heard this, I thought there is obviously a documentary I have missed. <laughs> Here on the vast savannah grasslands of Africa, the pride of lions we have been monitoring have now not eaten in some eight days. The young cubs frolic playfully in the savannah sun, unaware that unless a kill is made soon, within the week they will almost certainly be dead. However, on the morning of the ninth day, one of the lionesses returns from a hunting sortie, with good news for the pride. <laughs> she has located the scent of that most revered, rare, and elusive of all the lion's prey on the entire continent of Africa. <laughs> I am speaking, of course, of the chicken. And the good news is, it's a medium chicken. <laughs> I fucking think not. <laughs> the bloke gets in the cage and he thinks he's going to go, da da, chicken. And the lions are going to go, ah, chicken, he's brought chicken. Gavin, phone the leopards, get the slow cooker back. <laughs> We've got chicken. <laughs> You've a cocker van? <gasps> We've had a cocker van for ages. Have we got any red left? We must have a bottle of red left. <laughs> what about that Merlot that the um, Gibbons bought us? We must still have that. <laughs> oh, you did not drink that. Oh, you bastard. <laughs> no, he gets in the cage and he goes, da-da, chicken! And the lions go, ah, dinner! And he appears to have bought a starter, bless. <laughs> Real life. You know, that's it. There are two real stories there. The woman getting hit by the lion, the bloke's getting in the cage. True. I'm going to tell you one more true thing and then I'm going, right? I'll tell you the true thing. This concerns me. It's about myself. It's quite a personal true thing. Uh, I, I'm, uh, as I've said before, I'm 38. 
And uh, I have a fear that I've had since my childhood, still with me, still ravaged by it. Uh, I don't know if I have any fellow sufferers in here tonight. Uh, could I please he hear the voices of anyone in this evening who's frightened of spiders? Yes. Thank you. My people, God bless you. The rest of you, of course, shit-eating scum can fuck off. <laughs> and I mean that in a loving way, but you don't know what we have to deal with on a completely 24-hour-a-day basis. And it's completely irrational as well. Totally irrational. And uh, many people are frightened of spiders because of an incident, a specific incident. Maybe when they're a baby lying in the cradle, asleep, quietly. And a primal memory tells them to be frightened of these things. Or maybe when you're about four, you're at play school, and you get your lunch out, you get your little beaker of treetop squash, and you open your Thunderbirds lunchbox expecting a penguin and some peanut butter and jam sandwiches with the crusts cut off just like mummy does. <laughs> and some crisps. <laughs> you know, you'd remember that, wouldn't you? <laughs> I'm frightened of the fucking things and I don't know why. You know, I can't remember a specific incident. It's just a general, generic fear of spiders. Something you should also know is I can't kill them. If I see one, I can't just get the trainer of doom and go... <laughs> For two main reasons. Firstly, you know, the, some spiders are fucking massive. You know, you'd just be... It'd be like a Tarantino film. Just, <laughs> spider bollocks and lungs everywhere. <laughs> Get them out of your teeth. Jesus. I don't kill them for that one practical reason, but also because there's a poem my nan told me. Now, I can't remember this poem, but the gist of it is, kill spiders, get cancer, so I don't fuck around with spiders. <laughs> But as I'm 38, I'm a logical, progressive thinking man. I've got systems and ways of dealing with spiders. I have categorised them into three main categories. There are subdivisions within those three categories. I'm not going to go into them tonight. I'm just giving you the blanket overview. Category ones. They're anything from the teeny weeny little money spider, lucky my ass, right the way <laughs> up to about an inch. There, your general wall crawler. Oh, yeah, that's sort of big. Now, the first time I will see one, as an arachnophobe, is, is, is just through the movement. Blah, 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 blah. <laughs> the movement is what we pick up on. Blah, 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 blah. Blah, 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 blah. <laughs> People that are frightened of spiders have got very good peripheral vision. Really good. I'm looking at you, mate. <laughs> right, now, I'm looking at you. I could see a spider there. <laughs> That's how good my peripheral vision is when it comes to spiders. So let's say... I'm at home watching TV on the skirting board over there is a category one. So here we are, watching telly. Blah, 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 blah. In my head, this is what now happens. <laughs> spider alert, spider alert. Please increase heart rate and commence sweating now. <laughs> Could you confirm with a visual sighting, please? We don't want to get all worked up over a tomato stalk again, do we? <laughs> Don't you feel like a fucking idiot when you do that? Because it's always when you're actually cutting tomatoes, you know, you go... Confirmed with visual sighting. And I look round and, you know, it is a spider. Sighting confirmed. React verbally. <laughs> That's my verbal reaction to a Category 1. <laughs> you might have your own. <laughs> I don't fucking care. Mine is... <laughs> Just a burst of sound. <laughs> and then you have to go to the kitchen. Get a glass. Then go to the pinboard in the kitchen. Get a postcard and you go back to the original sighting point of the spider. You must do this quite quickly, because if you get back to the original sighting point and the spider has gone, that's a shame. Because you can never use that room again in your entire life, ever. <laughs> Within five minutes, I'm nailing it up. Children, let us never speak of the old living room again, for it is a place of evil. <laughs> No, but if you're lucky, it's just still there, and you go over with a glass, and you're a bit... Ha, ha, 
Blah, 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 blah. Ah! Bastard. <laughs> you get the glass over. Good. Okay, so the glass is over. Now, you know, you have to slide the postcard underneath. And this is a terrible bit because this is the closest you get. You know, you're sliding the postcard underneath the glass and the spider. And this is something that frightens you, rigid. But all the while you're doing it, you're thinking, I hope I don't catch one of his little legs. <laughs> The spiders really don't like it. They run up and down the inside of the glass, you know, and uh, it's, it's just, it's, it's pretty much, imagine if you're in a toilet cubicle and someone started sliding four foot of MDF under you. You'd be like, fuck off, what's, fuck, what are you fucking doing? It's pretty much the spider's angle, you know. So you get this little postcard glass spider capsule and you have to go to the end of your garden. I go all the way to the end of the garden. There. Now I can't just tip it out in case it jumps on the fence, then back on my face. <laughs> so I've got this system worked out. What I do is this. I just get the spider, the postcard, the glass, and I go... Ah! <laughs> it's a physics thing, really, because if you do that with a glass, it's just sort of... <laughs> centripetal force catapults the spider out of the glass, three or four gardens on a good throw. But the ordeal is not over there. Because what you've got to do now is check the glass. You must check the glass in case the spider has done this. <laughs> you walk back into the house and the very last thing you do when you've got rid of a spider is you go, ooh. <laughs> I don't know why it seems to help. Okay, that was category ones. Category twos. Okay, category twos. They're, they're anything from an inch up to about three, and they're the ones that you can hear before you see them, particularly if you've got strip pine floor. The other day, there was once when I saw a category two, right? I swear, right? I'm sat in the kitchen, and outside in the hall, I can hear. And I'm thinking to myself, you know, what are the odds that Adam and the ants have reformed? <laughs> doing a gig in my hall. Fairly slim, I would say. And you look out in the hall and there it fucking is, big old bastard coming down the hall towards you. Jin, 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 ha! Jin, 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 ha! Jin, 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 ha! Jin, 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 ha! The cry, therefore, when you see a Category 2 spider is... Kitchen, glass, postcard. Now you must run when it's a category two back to the original sighting point because if you get there and it's gone, you know, that's a fucker because you've got to put your house on the market, there's all that to deal with. <laughs> and take it from me, it is very, very difficult to sell a house with a fat bloke stood in the front garden going, please buy this hellhole! <laughs> For the love of God! Motivated seller. <laughs> the other thing that can go wrong with category twos is when you get the glass about 18 inches from them, you suddenly realise, you know, this fucking glass ain't big enough, is it? <laughs> <laughs> Pyrex mixing bowl. <laughs> Dark side of the moon on vinyl. <laughs> um. <laughs> Book a taxi. <laughs> I'd say a minimum of 15 miles should be about right. <laughs> gravel pits are good. Got gravel pits, go there. <laughs> Check the bowl. <laughs> Check the album sleeve, just in case they've... <laughs> oh, fucking hell, I've heard this in ages. <laughs> Pink Floyd's... Uh, uh, why I reckon Dark Sutherland, good Pink Floyd spiders like the Floyd. Spiders, big dope heads. <laughs> oh, spiders, huge dope heads. It's, it's their drug of choice. Uh, this was found out recently at Cambridge. The research scientists would test drugs on spiders because spiders make webs, and so there you've got something tangible you can look at to see how the drug has affected the spider. So you've got spiders on speed, normal web, two minutes. You've got like. 
spiders, you know, on cocaine, a really fucking shitty, badly designed web, but they're telling all the other spiders it's fucking fantastic. <laughs> Spiders on acid doing fractals and, you know, Jimi Hendrix, you know, <laughs> designs within the web. <laughs> and spiders on heroin just selling thread to other spiders. To... <laughs> the reason spiders like dope so much is on, you know, they can just get one joint and they can just pass it around themselves all night. So... <laughs> oh, okay. <laughs> And again, lucky me. <laughs> uh, I just thought it was something funny. It was a big old, big old bumblebee flew right through the web. <laughs> bumblebee, bumblebee, bumblebee. <laughs> Blue bottles. God, give a blue bottle. I'm fucking starving. Give me a blue bottle. A crane fly then. Fucking anything, I'm starving. <laughs> no, no, come on, let's go upstairs and frighten fatty. Get back into the taxi, you go, <laughs> Okay, that's that dealt with. Category threes are the biggest category of all. Okay. I've only ever seen category threes twice in my life. The first time I was nine and it was in my mum's house. And when I say it was actually in the bathroom. Uh, actually actually come to think of it, it was in the bath. Now when I say in the bath, it was actually having a bath. <laughs> Six legs up the tap end, <laughs> reading the Daily Mirror. <laughs> Fucking hell, Bobby Moore's gone to Fulham. What's that all about? <laughs> all right. You're right, son, you don't look well. <laughs> the cry, therefore, when you see a category three spider is <laughs> Now, I saw one quite recently also. Um, I saw it. Uh, in the cellar. Uh, I was clearing out the cellar of the new house I'd moved to because of a Category 2 incident I really don't want to talk about now. <laughs> and whenever I'm clearing out, whenever I have to do anything manly, I always ask my father-in-law to help me. Now, the reason that I ask my father-in-law to help me all the time is because we don't get on and I feel it's my role to build bridges and to ensure that we do have a good relationship with each other. And I think that asking him to help me with these small domestic tasks is one way of us building a relationship together, you know. It's been tricky, it's been a bit uphill. I don't know why we don't get on. I think it's a generational thing, you know. He grew up in the impoverished east end of London. I grew up in the home counties, you know. I believe his father worked in the docks. You know, my, my um, father was chart surveyor, you know. These are totally different backgrounds. You know, he grew up during the war, you know. He was in the Merchant Navy, he was at Dunkirk. There's things like that, you know, I've had no life experience, I've had an easy life, I was in the civil service, you know, I worked in the music business, I was a stand-up comedian, you know, I've had the sweet life compared to him. And I think that is it. It's a class and generational based difference is the reason behind our problem. My mate Dave thinks uh, it's because I'm fucking his daughter. <laughs> You know, different theories. <laughs> so like, all right, all right, Bill, we, you want to help me clear out the cellar? What did you say, you scumbag? <laughs> 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 well, we clear out the cellar. 
do I fucking have to? <laughs> no, no, not really. Please. And he always will because he doesn't want to upset his princess. So he came down, he's helping me with the cellar, and right, I'm down there and I'm so sort of worried about the father in law, I'm not really fully spider au fait. <laughs> the spider radar is in the off position. <laughs> So I go down into the cellar, and like a fucking idiot, I go into the darkest, dampest, dankest corner of the room where there's a big old black oak dresser. And I go right up to this fucking thing, because thinking, I'll get, I'll get this one out, Ben, all right, mate, I'll push it out, then we'll get it up the stairs, all right. Talk to me again, I'll stab you. So I go over in the corner and I reach round behind this dresser. Oh no, not yet. <laughs> I pull it out about sort of 18 inches. <laughs> then I brace myself against the cellar wall. This is a good way of moving a dresser, you should make a note. Brace myself against the cellar wall to push it out with my foot and my hand. Okay, so I'm pushing. <laughs> And I get it about three foot out from the wall. And then I start to feel a little bit queer. <laughs> no. <laughs> no, it can't be. I haven't felt like this since I was nine. <laughs> oh, no, please, no. Not now. Not here. And there, in the corner of the cellar, is a bigger Category 3 than the one I saw when I was nine. This one, reading Joseph Heller's Catch-22. <laughs> this spider, that's wearing a beret, looks up at me and goes, He died last year, you know. A tragic loss to the world of literature, don't you agree? I always thought he had another novel in him. What say you? <laughs> Who's to say, really? <laughs> Father-in-law looks over at me. He thinks it's the heart attack he's been praying for every day since he met me. He's like... What is it? Heart attack, son. Shooting pains in the left arm, tightness in the chest. Go on, die, 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 <laughs> die, die. <laughs> what I say is, I say a sentence that has now completely made mine and my father-in-law's relationship totally irreconcilable. But I was under a great deal of pressure. You must understand that. I look at him into those harsh East End eyes and I go... Little tip for you. Never say that to someone that was at Dunkirk. <laughs> A spider! For Christ's sake, get out of it! And he lifts his big old docker's boot up to step on this spider, and I go, No, no, you can't kill him! But I can't remember Nan's poem. <laughs> so I do five minutes of interpretive jazz dance about why it's bad to kill spiders. And he goes, oh, sorry, I didn't realise. <laughs> I won't kill it then. No, he doesn't kill it. What he does is, bends down, picks it up. No glove. No tongs. No specially designed suit. The legs of this spider <laughs> s 
sticking out from his knuckles. <laughs> Each one four inches long, black, spiky, and not looking very happy. <laughs> Thrashing, in fact. He's holding this spider in his hand, which is doing this. <laughs> and then my father-in-law says this to me. Fucking hell, it's a big one, isn't it? <laughs> Are you people out there that aren't frightened of spiders? I find it quite odd how you often end up with someone who is frightened of spiders. I think of that as a symbiotic relationship ordained by God. <laughs> someone you love, someone you're probably married to, someone you made vows to in sight of the Lord. Something about protect, I seem to recall. You know their cry of anguish when they have encountered one of these beasts. <coughs> oh, he's seen a spider again. <laughs> Hurry up, Sheila, it's massive. All right, I'm coming. <laughs> Where are you? I'm in the spare room. It's fucking huge. <laughs> All right, where is it? Over there on the wall. All right, shut up. <laughs> I got it. But once you get it in your hand, a strange change comes over you. <laughs> you suddenly become aware that your relationship's dynamic has altered somewhat. You now hold all the cards. The balance of power is tipped in your favour. Do you want to look? <laughs> That's the kicker phrase, isn't it? Do you want to look? That's the very least you'll do. You can't not torment your partner with a spider. You get it? They're shitting themselves, and as you're walking out the door, you go, nah! <laughs> Fuck off, babe, that ain't funny. Don't do that. No, stop. Fuck off. Don't do that again. Don't find snow funny. <laughs> this is what my father-in-law does. He extends his arm, and he goes, do you want to look? Like that. I'm only standing in front of him, his hand ends up there, three inches from my face. Do you remember our little chat earlier about the length of the spider's legs? The spider's legs were four inches, his hand is three inches from my face, leaving an overlap of one inch of spider leg. <laughs> they go in and out of my eye a few times, up my nose, I'm just being touched all over by spider. And it, one of my eye, one of my nose, two in my mouth, and one tickle in my cheek, like that, you know. Now, at this point, I react physically. <laughs> Pissing like a jet ski. I am vomiting food out. I don't. From the 60s, old English spangles. <laughs> Jubblies. Aztec bars, you know. I have shat my spinal cord out. It's flapping between my buttocks like some sort of crazy tail. Oh no, I need that. Oh, we've got a bit of a situation now, haven't we? Spider, category three, in the father-in-law's hand. So what I have to do, go upstairs, bring down the wheelie bin, put the wheelie bin over my father-in-law and the spider, <laughs> then get a snooker table, slide that underneath, <laughs> hire a lorry, drive to Dover to the White Cliffs, get the, get the, get the snooker table and the wheelie bin and go, Aah! off the White Cliff. Check the wheelie bin in case my father-in-law has done this. <laughs> then get in the cab of the lorry and go, Ooh.
Good night. Life is incredible. Celebrate it. Live it. Expose yourself to the sheer diversity of life. People say it's a small world. Oh, really? Seems pretty bleeding massive to me, mate. It's huge. And it's populated by the most amazing, unique, and beautiful people. Morning. Just like you. Explore life's mysteries. <laughs> Try something different. <laughs> Immerse yourself. Drink it all in. Don't just accept what life throws at you. Check something back once in a while. You only get one shot at the title. So be magnificent. Have some of that! <laughs>